have a word of prayer. And I found something today. I'll tell you what this is in a minute. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do love you. We thank you for a nice, cool day. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for all the help that you give us and the way that you love us. And Father, you treat us better than we've treated you. And you treat us better than we've even treated ourselves, Father. So, Father, we're very thankful for that. We pray, dear God, that you'd bless and guide us tonight. Help us as we study your word to find your wisdom, your love for us. Help us, dear God, to love you and to serve you. And, Lord, help us, Father, with the things that we've learned uh, to find somebody else that we can help, somebody that we can be a blessing to. We thank you, God, for helping us, uh, Lord, in our sobriety and in honoring you with our minds and our hearts and our bodies. We pray, dear God, that you would just bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was straightening up my desk the other day, which doesn't come easy for me, and um, I found this. I saved it for a reason. Um, when I first was sent to uh, the treatment place where they sent me uh, to get off all of the Percocet and everything like that. Then they gave me this little name tag and I had to, you know, wear it inside the building and then wear it, you know, in the room. So it's just, Roy, you're familiar with this, Mike, I'm Michael H., you know. And um, so I remember after I did all of those meetings, I was going to throw that away and then I decided not to. I thought, you know what? I'm going to keep that. I'm going to hang on to that. And what that is, is it's a reminder to me of what I had gone through, what I did to get myself one of those. And um, uh, it was a reminder the reason I kept it was so that I, I would never, ever, ever think myself too good to ever have to wear one of these. Never think of myself as being uh, so good that the people that are out there that need help I'm not too good to help them. I'm not too good. I'm not above them. I'm the same as, but I'm not better than them. When, um, and I think she still lives there. There's a person in this immediate neighborhood who for a while we, we know almost for a fact that she was dealing meth out of the basement of her grandma's house because all of a sudden our shed was getting broke into and stuff like that. There was stuff going on. People were pulling down in the parking lot, running over to that house and then coming back out five minutes later, you know, all those signs, you know. And then the guy that on a Sunday afternoon, they found him passed out up here by the church sign and um, when somebody, this is between sun, Sunday morning service and the afternoon evening service, when somebody told me about it, um, my first instinct was to call the police. I got yelled at from some people, from and I'm using the term ignorant in the correct sense, from some ignorant people who thought I was just being mean and unchristian to them but I knew that cops carried Narcan. And I assumed that that's what it was. The guy had overdosed on heroin, which is now today's is laced full of fentanyl and that the Narcan would have brought him out. Well, he wasn't over, he wasn't ODing on, on heroin. He was, he was just out of his mind on meth. And then um, when the cops, John was up there talking to him and 
you know, he kind of came to. And John wanted to know if he, you know, wanted to pray with him. And the guy said, no, I don't want anything to do with that. So he walked off. Well, the cops caught him down here at the gas station because we gave him the description. And he had a he had another dose of meth in his pocket, and his plan probably was when he came down off that one, he was going right back up again. So, did it save his life? Well, the next I don't think it was the next day, but a couple days after that, he stopped by here again, and uh, John knew who he was, so he brought him into my office, and I talked to him a little bit. And I just said, look, I, I said, in a way, I kind of know what you're dealing with and what's going on. And I looked him right in the eye. And I said, one of the things I know about you is that you really didn't plan on living your life like this. And you know for a fact that you're going to die this way unless God intervenes in your life. And I saw him start to tear up and break down a little bit. And no sooner than he did that, then he kind of sucked it all back up again. And um, hadn't <laughs> seen him since. You know, I've prayed for him, prayed that God would watch over him. Uh, but it's just a reminder. Uh, when when I saw this on my desk tonight, I thought, you know, that's I'm going to talk about that. That. None of us are too good uh, to reach out and to help somebody else who have faults in their life. Well, they just got the treatment center I was in. I already thought somebody on drugs, you know, mine was alcohol, you know. Yeah. That, that was okay until being around both sides hey there's no difference mm -hmm. just because uh, just because you made one legal alcohol is legal and drugs is illegal yeah just because otherwise it's they mess your mind and your body up yeah. just because you made one legal doesn't doesn't make either one of them no right um the so, uh, it, go ahead it, if, you know, being there and uh, things start jiving, I, I start seeing both sides of the coin. I said, ain't no difference. Yeah. The word that that brought to my mind um, is the word fault. Um, if you were to take that word and then apply it to the things that you did. How would you use that word to describe yourself? The word fault. How would you how would each one of you use that word? I'll I'll start it out. It isn't anybody else's fault but mine. It's my fault. Uh, nobody put the drink in my hand. I put put it in, in my own hand. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't mad at the wife. I was mad at my boss. Uh, yeah, my all of my so-called family they were as growing up it was. Yeah, kind of shaky, but uh, overall, I did it to myself. Mm hmm. And I can already say if you want to find your worst enemy in the world, go stand in front of the mirror. Right. The person you see there, yeah. that's your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. my, my dad always asked, like, some of us, we had, he had seven kids between him and my stepmom. And he always asked, you know, some of them turned out great, very successful in life. Others turned out drug addicts and in and out of jail and treatment. And he's like, what did I do wrong? I said, you didn't do anything wrong. We're, we're grown adults and um, 
we cho we chose to pick and pick and choose what we want to take what you taught us and apply it. And some of us chose different things, or we all chose different things. But um, it's not. It's just we just went down different paths. But he blames himself for our our problems in our, our lives. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of where his depression comes from. And uh, some people around us blame him for our, our relapse, but mm -hmm. I, I don't. Mm -mm. Um, if it's anybody, it's the devil, you know, I mean, because mm -hmm. he's trying to go after me, couldn't get to me, he's going to go what, to Pam, now I see he's after the kids, mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I, I see that, you know, and that's... We gotta, we gotta work on our kids, because we really gotta pray for them, because it's just, it's complete chaos in our house, and we're trying to take them to church, and it's just, they've been out of church for over a month, because we went to rehab, mm -hmm. so they're not used to sitting, you know, still in... The devil's using that, you know. So. And he will. Um, the I'm going to take some of these verses out of order, but look at Galatians six. Uh, the first one is the one I, I want to deal with. This one now, uh, Galatians six verse one, brethren, and Paul's not talking to lost people here. He's talking to brethren. He's talking to the church. He's talking to those of us who are already saved. We believe the Bible. We believe Christ died for us. We believe in God. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. And it's the idea that it can happen to anybody. If a man be overtaken in a fault, then ye which are spiritual... Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, not judgmentalism, not arrogance, not slapping them around. What'd you do this for, you idiot? Do you know what kind of embarrassment you are to us? And none of that stuff. I've seen all that. I've been in church all my life and I have seen that. And it serves no purpose whatsoever because there are people... Especially now, especially now, you know, back when I was little, you know, people, you know, were incensed if somebody, God forbid, somebody in the church ever did anything wrong. Well, how dare they? But it's a different world now. Okay. And it's almost expected that if you're going to have anywhere from 50 to 100 people in a church, you're going to have several of them that's going to be having some pretty rough stuff in their life. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So then he says, bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's the two commandments we're under, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And we have the story of the good samaritan who that was christ telling us who is our neighbor well it's basically everybody there isn't anybody that isn't our neighbor so then he says verse three for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing he deceiveth himself and and i can say this i've been in church practically all my life i've been in this church since eight years old been uh, Bible college been pastor of two different churches been supposedly serving the Lord uh, when I even when I was a teenager here I was in charge of I did all the music and Pastor Golf, Preacher Golf, put me in charge of the visitation on Thursday night. That was when I was 17 years old. And if anybody thought himself to be something, it was me. It was me guaranteed. I thought that I could do no wrong. And what a blessing I was for God to have selected me, you know, to serve him. What, you know, what, what, what a, what a great guy God picked for his service. And that was me. And that was my opinion of myself. And I, if anybody, if anybody 
thought himself to be something when he was nothing, it was me. Hands down, it was me. And I deceived myself. And if you can deceive yourself, you can deceive a whole lot of other people too. And I did. Okay? So then verse 4. But let every man prove his own work. And what I found out is, even though I, you know, I can, I can get up in front of people and talk. That's easy for me. I can get up and sing and play music. That's easy for me as well, too. So at one point, I told myself as a young, young minister, Mike, you pretty much write your own paycheck. You pretty much go to whatever church you wanted to, however big it was. You could probably name your church and get it. And I ain't kidding you. I was very full of myself. Very, very full of myself. But what I didn't know that God was going to do was he was going to absolutely dry up any chance that I had of going anywhere and doing anything for God because I thought too highly of myself and I didn't care about anybody else but I, uh, but I cared about me a lot but I didn't care about anybody and so that was that was me this verse is me right here I deceived myself I wanted to prove myself but God wouldn't let me God what God wanted to show everybody was that I'm absolutely no good. And I'll tell you what, there were several things that broke me. One of them was uh, a pastor that, uh, right after Lisa and I got married, um, he pastored a Baptist church in this area. And some of the people in the church knew me and they wanted me to be sort of like an assistant pastor at the church, like a youth pastor and, and things like that. And um, I had met the pastor before, uh, my sister and another guy, we had a singing group and we sang at his church one time. So I interviewed with him, the pastor, and he said, Mike, can I be honest with you? I said, yeah, sure, go ahead, I can take it. And he said, you know, the first time I met you, you know what I thought? And I'm ready for this, I'm like, go ahead and tell me what you thought of me. <laughs> and he said, I thought you were the most arrogant, cocky, prideful person I've ever met in my life. And he was dead on. And you know what's odd about that? That man is now an avowed, out in the open, sodomite. The pastor of that church. Okay? And... It took that and a lot of other things for God to just break me down to where there was pretty much nothing left. So, let every man prove his own work, then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. And the thing about that is, I and I alone was responsible for my downfall. For my, you know, the doctor prescribed me the Percocet. Okay, I just didn't, I just didn't do it right. Okay, and um, there was something else that I've, I found out today um, that I'll probably talk about that at another meeting. Um, I had actually had a DNA test done. Um, and my doctor wants to see the results, but he thinks that it's going to show that um, I have this incredible tolerance for things like pain meds, opiates. Whereas, you know, my wife can take half of one and be fine. And me, no, it's, I got to take 70, 80, 100 milligrams. That's right. Like me taking benzos, I was prescribed clodipins mm -hmm. for anxiety, and I'd take two of them at a time. Brian would take it if you say you take a half one, he'd be out for a week. Yeah, so and that's something we will talk about uh, maybe next time we get together is the genetics of it because it does play into it. I believe that, 
But the idea of fault, though, all of us have a fault. We have that fault in us. We were born with it. And when it comes time to start blaming, maybe one of the things that kept us from getting sober or getting help or wanting to be better was we were blaming everybody else. But the bottom line is, it was our fault. We did it. Look at Psalm 19. That's the top verse there. Uh, it starts out with verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. And I love that. I went to visit my, math, my son Matthew's church. They go to a fundamental King James only church. And the sermon that he preached, he just happened to preach Sunday morning was why we use the King James Bible. And I'm, I'm going, that's right up my alley. Glad you, glad you preached that one. But it is. The law of the Lord is perfect. And that's present tense. It's right now perfect. And it converts the soul. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't convert the flesh. It doesn't convert the flesh. Roy, your flesh, when you gave your life to the Lord, God didn't say, I'm going to dry up all your desire for alcohol for the rest of your life. He didn't do that. Not quite. Nope. But it says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, he's talking about the Bible now, is thy servant warned. Didn't we all know that what we were doing was wrong? Sure we did. And in keeping of them is great reward. Now, verse 12. Who can understand his errors? And that gets to, you know, Roy, I'm sure they, they went through this in the 12 steps was understanding that you and you alone were responsible for what brought that into your life. You and you alone. Now, there may be other, there may be uh, things that the devil did to aid that. Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, your upbringing, okay? Um, you know, maybe all of us can look back in our life and see how, you know, maybe some of the things that were done to us, with us, or whatever. I I grew up with a, a guy in this church and uh hadn't seen him for a long time but he knew to come to me um when he was fixing that he was pretty sure he, they were going to violate his parole and he told me what had happened he said you know he said mike you know when the first time i smoked marijuana was i said no he said when i was 12 and he said my old my two older brothers i caught them doing it they lit me up and got me high so that I wouldn't tell mom and dad. That's how my brother got me smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And he said that's, and of course he was right. They violated his parole and he did about five, six years down Bon Terre. And, um, but the bottom line is we did it. We did it. Who can understand his errors? And then, the rest of that verse, verse 12, cleanse thou me from secret faults. Now, there are things that I'm going to talk about at these meetings, and there are things that I'm not going to talk about at these meetings. And everybody has them. Okay? There are things that probably shouldn't be talked about because... I do believe that there's a reason why we're not Roman Catholics. There's a reason why we don't have to tell the priest every little thing that we did. 
there's some things. More. Yeah, because yeah, because it's turning him on too. That's that. I, I'll show you a book that says that. But anyway, um, there are things that are between me and God. Things between you and God. Now it's okay to you know talk about some of them maybe in a generic fashion here. Maybe there's more than one reason why. Number one, we're here. Number two, the people that are are going to be watching this online they get the benefit of benefiting from this meeting without having everybody in their life know what's going on i had a guy call me one time i mean and he was very blunt with it he was telling me that he was a man in his 60s he was married and he admitted to me that he was having some real issues with, he basically said, I like, he said, I'm a closet homosexual. And he was telling me that his preferred, of course, him being in the 60s, his preferred age was, you know, young guys in their early 20s. I kind of suspect that he didn't probably stop there, probably went younger, whether he actually did it or not, or just thought about it. But that's kind of what I suspected. But there's a lot of people out there that are struggling with secret faults. And they think the devil's told them that there, there's no help for them. There's no cure for them. They might as well just give in. In fact, everybody else in the world's giving in. You might as well join the club. In fact, they're probably going to legalize everything you're trying to keep secret right now anyway. So just join the club. It'll be legal and then it'll be okay. Okay. But the purpose of the Bible is to cleanse us from those secret faults. And the deal that God makes when Jesus told that story about, you know, if, uh, if a brother is, overtaken in sin and you go to him and try to confront him with his sin if he confesses then it's over with and i see that that's how the holy spirit comes to us does it the exact same way holy spirit comes to us tries to talk to us about our sin and if we'll if we'll let god deal with us if we'll let the holy ghost soften our hearts chasten us like a father does his son beat the daylights out of us where we're saying, God, I can't carry this anymore. Then when we are forgiven of that, God says, okay, it stops here. It doesn't go anywhere else. This would be between me and you, and nobody will know. But if you don't do that, I think the Holy Ghost lets somebody else in on it, somebody who actually sees you do it, even though you don't know they know you did it. And then he's going to bring them in on it. Now that somebody knows what you're doing, and then after that, if you still won't repent, he's going to bring some more until eventually, that's what everybody knows about you. Okay, I think God does it exactly that way. God's preferred method is to always keep it between you and him. When I was in a treatment center, uh, one thing you have to do, you have to go downstairs if you're going to eat or not. You have to go, if you choose not to, you have to sit down by the nurses. Grace, back that little kid sitting in the corner with a dunce cap on. Well, I step in the bathroom to kind of wash my face, to kind of get ready to go down. And there was a boy sitting behind me. Give me what for? I don't take a custom from nobody. I turned around. I was going to pop somebody. There was nobody behind me. I look out in the hall. Nobody there. I got weak in the knees. I sat down on the side of the couch, uh, couch bed, and tears start coming to my eyes. That's when I start to say, 
say look in the mirror and after I start getting myself back together and I went on downstairs and I came back up and start the, the meetings and everything not all at once but things start kind of knitting together I start well, I start listening to what people were saying mm -hmm. yeah but it it's up that voice. Now, where that voice came from, uh, the words that was using, I don't think it was God. No, I started to say it didn't sound like, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. Because Morris told me to get my head out of my butt. Might have been conscience. Yeah. I don't know what it was, Brother Mike, but I got scared. Oh, did I get scared. I believe that. Look at verse 13 there. Keep back thy servant also. What is a presumptuous sin? Presumptuous. What happens when you presume something? Okay. Uh, you presume maybe that the boss says it's okay if you pull in 15 minutes late. Okay. Boss is standing there when you pulled in 15 minutes late and saying, I don't know what you were thinking, but I'm docking you a half hour's pay. If you thought that was okay, that, then you thought wrong. A presumptuous sin are those sins that we think God will be okay with, that they're just little things and it doesn't mount to a hill of beans. It doesn't affect anybody but me. So no harm, no foul. Or, it's the idea that I'll go ahead and do it. God will forgive me. He always has. That's a presumptuous sin. And that's, look at that verse. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And that is at the core of every addiction and every struggle with sin doesn't matter if it's drugs, prescriptions, alcohol, pornography, sex, you name it, shop, shopping addictions, doesn't matter what it is. When they rule over you and you have absolutely no control to say no, then they're the boss and you're not. That is a, that is a sin that has dominion over you so keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins let them not have dominion over me then shall i be upright and i shall be innocent from the great transgression and i have been with fundamentalist preachers all my life and i can tell you stories that would just curl your hair of what men thought they could do and get away with it because their doctrine said that no matter what they did, they're always going to be saved. And so why do I even have to worry about repenting of what I'm doing? Because no matter what, I'm God's never going to go after me. And that's presumptuous. There's also um, tempting the Lord too. Exactly. It is tempting. It is. That's, that's tempting the Lord. I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, I've... He'll forgive uh, anything, but I mean... Brian, if, if you I... you say he owes it to you, then... <laughs> I've heard of King James only fundamentalist preachers molesting their own daughters. And the guys they ran with thought they were the most spiritual, godly men that they've ever... And they were molesting their own children for crying out loud. That's that's the kind of stuff that that's talking about. They they're sinning presumptuous sins. They have dominion over them, and yet they want everybody to see that's a cover up. They want everybody to think that they're Mister Hot Spirituality, okay? And it's a cover. Look at uh, James five. This is what this is what we're doing here. James five. James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another. Now, he's not saying 
sins. So there's not, in, in our doctrine and in our belief and from the Bible, there's no, no commandment whatsoever that says that I have to sit down once a week and tell you everything that I did, said, thought, or we're going to think or say or do. Nothing like that at all. Number one, it's, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to have somebody have all of that information about you because somebody's going to turn on you one of these days. Somebody, I've seen, I've had it happen to me before. But he said, confess your faults one to another. And when you have a, uh, whether it's a, a group like this, or, you know, some churches where it's just maybe, you know, once every three months the men get together and they have a, a talk amongst themselves about, you know, what it's like to face the challenges in the world that we live in today and trying to be godly men, trying to be good men with their families and husbands and good leaders in the church and so on. But I think those, I think we need more of those and not less. But confess your faults one to another. And then pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, this is where that verse comes in. That's the context of it. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We've heard that verse before. Now we know what context it's in. It's in the direct context of us like coming here and confessing, okay, uh, you know, Roy was this kind of that. And Brian and Pam, they did this, I did this, and others, they've done, you know, these things here. And we, I'm not going to give you the specifics. I'm not going to, again, there's things about me that nobody will ever know. Nobody will. God does. My wife knows. But things that nobody should know. But to say that we all have faults, we all, none of us are perfect. And then to pray for the people who are not perfect. You know, I pray for my wife uh, every day. Because my wife, I think the world of her, she's not perfect. She prays for her husband every day. She thinks the world of me. We've been married 33 years. I wanted, I said, told her the other day, let's work on another 33. She said, I'm up for that. But I pray for her. She prays for me. I pray for all my children every day. I love my children. But I know they're not these perfect angels that never do anything wrong. I care so much about them. I love them. I want them. But I, I so my fervent prayers are almost always going to be about my wife, my children, my grandchildren, the people who are directly in this church and then the extended congregation that God has given us to take care of. That lady that we found almost dead in the field. I pray for her. Those orphans we found. I pray for them that God would bless them. And the pastors that in Kenya that benefit from us. I pray for them as well. But he says, and look at verse 17. This, this is what I like. Elias is Elijah. He was a man subject to like passions as we are. No. We think that could mean. Could that possibly mean that Elijah might have been someone who may have struggled with, I don't know, maybe he drank wine every now and then. Probably shouldn't have. We know he didn't take meth because they didn't. I mean, there was no, yes, yeah, there, there was, was no, no yeah, there was, something. <laughs> there was no cold medicines back then, and you know, whatever. Paul told uh, Timothy to take thy wine for thy stomach. A little, a little wine for thy stomach. Well, see. that's all I did. Yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> um, but he, Elijah had something, just like us sitting here. Well, we know Samson did. Samson. Strongest man in the world, except for when a pretty girl walked by. And then he had no control over himself whatsoever. Elias was a, lot, a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. 
And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, then one convert him. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. It's my encouragement to not only us here, those who are listening, if God has helped you, even if He's just helped you in little ways, if God has helped you with anything, whether it's drugs, prescription drugs, alcohol, porn, whatever it is, if God has helped you with those things, ask how you can be a blessing to somebody else. Ask how you can find... I mean, that's what the last time we gathered, I wanted you guys to tell... You know, I liked, I liked what your wife said. I, I want, Lord, I want to help somebody. And that, that verse there, if, 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 if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, shall hide a multitude of sins. I don't think it's just hiding the person you're helping. I think it's, I think God uses that to cover yours as well. I mean, what's in the, what's in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. So while we're in the process of helping somebody else and having their sins forgiven, God then is forgiving ours as well. If it's good enough for us, then it's good enough for them. Um, no, they just got Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one homecoming, there was a guy came all the way down from West Virginia just to see me. Mm -hmm. I, I can't I know the guy, but I can't remember the guy. It right. Makes sense. Right. Because you have told people about, hey, we got this drunk sitting out here. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. He came all the way down. It blessed him. Huh? It blessed him. Yeah. Um, it, who am I? I, I just a, a drunk. That's all. Yeah. Just so happy I ain't drinking. First Peter two twenty. Um, this is the part that we don't like, but it has to be there. First Peter two twenty. For what glory is it if, when you're buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? And First Peter is, um, I'm going to be doing another study on this again sometime. The whole, the whole thing of First Peter is, it's about suffering when you haven't done anything wrong. Suffering as a Christian, being persecuted for what you believe in, and that's coming. Okay, but then P Peter takes a time out from that, and he says, "What glory is it when you be buffeted for your faults? You shall take it patiently." In other words, you had it coming. Why are you acting as if some great, glorious, spiritual, wonderful thing happened when you got buffeted and you're acting like you're being persecuted for, your, for being a Christian? You're not being persecuted for being a Christian. You're being kicked in the butt for being an idiot. That's God's way of beating the snot out of you. And yet you're trying to make it look like you're being Mr. Holy Persecuted. And God hates that. But if, is everybody picking on me? Yeah. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. So, yes, I have faults. And yes, there's been times, and I say this as truthfully as I can, I have told God, God, I think you ought to not let me get away with that. God, I know you well enough to know, and I know me well enough to know that if you let me get away with doing stuff, then that's not going to be good. So I fully expect you to tan my hide over that. Here's the belt. Get busy. 
And I think that's always a best attitude to have. If you ask God to buffet you or you buffet yourself, you won't have to worry about when it's going to hit. But it's going to. And all that guilt that, you know, some psychiatrist or maybe somebody in your, you know, 30-day yoga experiment that you went through down there, they may have told you, no, guilt is bad. Don't feel any guilt. Guilt is the best friend you've got. It teaches you Let it eat you. Let it eat you alive. Let it tear you up inside until you can't take it anymore. And that's how God's going to work something in you. And then Matthew 18, um, verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Great, great, wonderful verse. <clears throat> if, if we were all here, not lost, there'd be no need for us to even be here. How think ye, if a man have, have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep, than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, and this is here, this is Jesus now. This is him telling us this. If thy brother, and again, we're talking about the brethren. We're talking about church people. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Don't you gossip about it. Don't you call somebody else first and tell them you go to them. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And again, I think God follows this exact method. I think God deals with us one-on-one -on -one about things we've done wrong. And if we won't listen... God's going to, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, God's going to get somebody else involved. Somebody you don't want to know about what you're doing. God's going to show them. If that person loves you, God has shown the right person because then they're going to come to you and say, look, I already know this. Okay. So let's not, let's not try to cover this up. Let's not lie. Don't lie to me because I already, I know what I saw. I know what you did. But I want you to know why I'm here. I'm here because I love you and I hear, I, I want you to confess. I want you to repent. I want you to get things right. Or you need to tell on yourself. Yeah. Oh yeah. Your, your Freudian slip is showing. <laughs> okay. Um, but then he says, uh, if he will not hear thee, then take one, with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, some people have a big problem with understanding what that means. The Catholic Church says, that's the priest's power to forgive sins. No, it isn't. Here's what I, here's what I really think this is. If we follow, if we follow this, let's say, let's say that, um, you know, you, you came to me, you know, when things had gone south, but had you not done that, had, had I, if I had to go to you and say, Brian, this is what I know. And Brian says, well, I'm not, listen, that's, I didn't do that. And, uh, you know, here's your wife sitting next to you. And, uh, honey, I'm, I promise you, I didn't do anything like that. I promise you. I don't know where Brother Mike's getting this. Well, the next time around, you know, me and two other people see it. So then we go to you and you're still not wanting to repent. That means I have to have a meeting at the church and I have to say, this is what Brian did. And 
I'm a witness to it. These two people here are witness to it. And if by then you still have no, you don't, don't want to repent whatsoever. I do. I think God, if we follow that method with trying to restore you and God knows it, I think as at that point, God will turn you over for the rest of your life to a reprobate mind. And because it was in our hands to forgive you, if you wanted to be forgiven, we would have forgiven you. God would have honored that. Yeah. Sorry, but I'm having trouble hearing. I'm not. At, I didn't ask you to listen to me. Oh, I'm. I'm getting. I'm going to show you something here in a little bit. I'm not yeah, happy with that. the times, you know how many times I, you know. I mean, I've had to come to you, you know, a couple of times. Yeah. You know, and um, I think that cuts the times. You know, some people really struggle. Yeah. And so you know, it kind of takes out well if they mess up. You know, how many times? You know, as long as you're. You know, you repent of it, and you're, and you're, you know, and you're not just doing it out of you know, living in sin. Yeah. And then He forgives you, but if you're not, you have to forgive us. Then. Uh, yeah, and I think that if finally the church says, you know what, if you're not willing to repent, yeah. then we can't forgive you. I think God honors that. I think mm -hmm. God says, okay, you're done. We're out. You're out of here. You're done. And I think God cuts you off for it ever after that. I don't think you're saved if it takes that much, does it? Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bingo. Yeah, that's, yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, you know, but, but, you know, some people, they, it's like, and, and I'll say this, in, in today's world, usually by the time it gets to where we're going to have a church meeting, somebody would say, yeah, I ain't, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I ain't going to show up for that. But you know what they'll do? They'll go to some other church. <laughs> they will. They'll go to some other church, and some probably a bigger church mm -hmm. where number one, it's not going to be preached against anyway. And number two, that way they can hide over there, still like Mister Spiritual, and everything's mm -hmm. fine. Um, I mentioned that I was going to talk about maybe the next time we get together um, about genetics and and addictions because I think there's something to that. I really do. So maybe if, you know, if you've got any thoughts on that, you know, just kind of be thinking along those lines. Um, some people react to alcohol. Some people don't. You know, some people could take a drink and put it down and never walk away and walk away and never be bothered by it again. But some people just can't do that. So maybe next time we get together, we'll talk about uh, something like that. Yeah. And um, you see, uh, you know, take people talking about, you know, s sipping whiskey. How in the world do you sip whiskey? You turn it up and you drink it. <laughs> in the meeting room, they're called normies. That's somebody that can go out and have a drink and then stop and go home to where we're, we're programmed different. It's yeah. all, you know, all or nothing. I mean, we go all oh, around. there's some left. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can't have that. Yeah, yeah well, I get that. Just, I I get uh, that. The fact was just one drink for me. Yeah. It's like yeah. In rehab, they're telling us that um, it's hereditary. It can be hereditary. It can be, and that's like with like both of us are, you know, how we are, and what's that mean for him? So you know? you've got somebody to think about now. Yeah. You've got somebody else's future to to think about instead of just your own. Exactly. So that yeah, I think it has an effect on us. And and I'll then we'll bring the Huh? Yeah. And I think we'll bring the the scripture part of that in too as well. So, all right. Let's have prayer and uh just remember remember your faults and then start thinking of maybe somebody that you'd like to reach out to to help them somebody maybe maybe somebody you used to buy from maybe somebody you used to do things with and um i get home i'll get this wrapped up and posted and then share the link and uh find some people that the things that you went through you were overtaken now you're considering others because you know they're overtaken as well and you know the answer to it. You know the way out. 
Father, we come to you and we thank you, God, for blessing us and for forgiving us and for having a lot of patience with us. And Father, it, it would be easier if we were God like you, but we're not. We're a long way from that. But that doesn't stop us from wanting to be like you. Holy, clean. Father, each one of us desires a clean heart, a right spirit. We want you to renew that in us. We wish, Father, we had never, never gone astray from you, never turned our back on you. But we did. So, Father, we just look forward to the day when you separate us from this flesh that we dwell in with its faults, even with its secret faults. And Father, we pray, God, that you would uh, help us with those as well. Not just the things that we're easily admitting. The things, Father, that we don't admit. We pray, God, that you would help us with those and then let, let us be an encouragement and a blessing to those, Father, who cannot admit the things that they have done to anybody. They have nobody to talk to, but they do have you. And I pray, Lord, that tonight, because of, Lord, what you've done in our lives, that somebody somewhere out there would we respond and, and come to you with their secret faults, knowing, God, that you'll forgive them. Give us grace. Help us, dear God, to be used. That's where our heart is. That's what our desire is. And Father, there's no greater feeling. It's, it's even better than getting high. The feeling to know that we were in your will and that you used us for your glory and your honor. We love you and we ask you to bless us in Jesus' name.